after stumbling through a lot of painful brokenness and separation, I've been blessed with experiencing a deeper level of connection with others than I ever thought was possible. My guest today provides significant evidence that we are all connected in a way that can provide greater happiness, wisdom, and creativity if only we open ourselves to these opportunities. Based on his career as a physician, a public speaker, and a New York Times best-selling author, Dr. Larry Dossey provides evidence that we can access this infinite pool of information, opening us up to increasing levels of joy, compassion, and love. <laughs> Hi, this is Marlena Fiol from Becoming Who We Truly Are, a YouTube show that deepens our understanding of who we are and also what's possible for us. If you find value in this video, please give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe button on your screen. It really does make a big difference. I am truly honored to introduce today's guest, Dr. Larry Dossey. Larry is an internal medicine physician who is deeply rooted in the scientific world. He is an international advocate of the role of the mind in health and the role of spirituality in health care. Larry is a New York Times bestselling author of Healing Words and also The Power of Premonitions, along with 10 other books that have all been translated and published around the world. His latest book is One Mind, and that's what we'll talk about today. A theme running through many of these YouTube episodes is that going through adversity sometimes leads us to more fully understanding who we are and what's possible for us. Larry's personal journey, as well as his message about one mind, certainly stretches us to reimagine the power of our true selves. At the end of this brief interview, we'll provide recommendations of additional informative programs on the power of the mind. Welcome, Larry. Marlene, it's great to be with you. Thank you for in your invitation. So let's begin with the most basic questions. Will you describe for our listeners what you're calling one mind? And how do we know that it exists? Well, I think the best way to describe it is to contrast it uh, with their ordinary uh, mind, which everyone knows by personal experience, it amounts to the stuff of the mind, the mental, the mental content, the thoughts, the emotions uh, that are a part of our mental life on a daily basis. Uh, the, the one mind includes uh, that output uh, from our mind and uh, but it goes further. The one mind is what I call consciousness. Consciousness is what makes our mental stuff possible. It is the background. It is the umbrella under which uh, our mental activity on a daily basis fits. Consciousness is deep to that. Yeah. It is what lies behind it. Yeah. So can you say a bit more about why our listeners would want to know about this one mind? Why, why is it important? <laughs> I think it's one of the most important things in our existence because the evidence shows that uh, people who are in tune with their deeper consciousness are simply happier, they're healthier, uh, they're more creative, they seem to be wiser. Yeah, so you're saying... We're healthier, we're wiser, we're more creative. All of this sounds absolutely wonderful. So the question then becomes, is this for mystics? Is it available <laughs> to any of us? How do we access this one mind? Can you speak well, to I that? Think, well, sure. Uh, of course, every major mystical spiritual tradition has had a, uh, a, a place in their philosophy for this idea of the one mind. You can trace it back uh, 3,000 years in the Hindu tradition where it was known as the Akashic Records. In yeah. uh, Zen, it's called Satori. In the tradition of yoga, it's called Samadhi. In Sufism, it's known as Fana. And in Christianity, it's often referred to as Christ consciousness. 
But the key to accessing the one mind, it seems to me, is just to turn off the rational mind. There are a million ways to do that. Well, one way that uh, certainly has become extremely popular in American and Western culture in general in recent years is meditation. But I, I think uh, there are other ways as well. One that my wife and I have employed for decades is simply exposure to nature. Uh, we find that uh, backpacking in wilderness areas in the United States, somewhere in the Rocky Mountains uh, in the summertime, is one of the great ways of opening up to something deeper than your, uh, your, your everyday sense of uh, consciousness. Uh, exposure to great art and great music is an avenue that works for a lot of people. But yeah. studies have shown that people who fill up their minds with Facebook and social media input tend to be lonelier than people who don't do that. So in one sense, uh, although I, I, I'm a great fan of social media, I think that it's a way of shooting ourselves in the foot. It's filling up all the the emptiness and uh, the space that this deeper awareness has of entering our, our being. And the last thing we should be doing is shutting those avenues off. Yeah. When yeah. all is said and done, I, I, I think that you really don't have to do anything to access the one mind. If we just clear our, our daily minds and start opening up instead of filling it up, I think the one mind does us, by which I mean that it is the natural state of things. Yeah. If we simply stop impeding the natural flow of this wisdom, I think it arrives automatically. It's not that we have to do anything to access it. Yeah, it's who we are if we open up to it. Yeah. That's very well put. Yeah. So you, you talk about turning off the rational mind, and it seems to me that part of that would also be letting go of our ego identity, which then would allow us to embrace an, a much more, a much expanded notion of who we are. I've myself been fascinated with identity for as long as I can remember. And <laughs> as I describe in my book, I grew up on a leprosy compound that my dad founded the year I was born. In oh a, my gosh. In a low German Mennonite community in Paraguay, South America. So <laughs> I experienced so many identities that I never really understood who I was growing up. And then later, not surprisingly, as an academic, I argued that strong personal and social identities are important because they, they satisfy psychological needs for belonging, self-esteem, locus of control, all these things. But your book, Larry, and this conversation also lead me to wonder if a strong sense of self, I mean, it's clearly important in so many ways, but does it also have the disadvantage of creating the individualization that essentially becomes a barrier to experiencing one mind. Well, I think we're, we're, what we're talking about here is that we need both sides. We, we do profit from a sense of self, a sense of individuality, but that's just one side of the coin. The other side is a deeper, unconscious, complementary, unitary uh, uh, sense of unity with all other living things. I'm not just talking about other people. I'm talking about all of sentient life on Earth. Uh, uh, you know, there's an old saying in transpersonal psychology that if you want to transcend the self, you, you first have to be one. <laughs> and th this is a way of saying that we need both sides. You know, people who don't have a sense of personality and self do not do well in life. You know, half the time spent on psychiatrist's couches is trying to understand and develop and, 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 and allow the permission of the self to come forward and take its proper place. If people try to transcend the ego without first having one, disaster generally is the result. Uh, I was absolutely shocked during medical school uh, to discover that many of the greatest scientists in Western history have stood up for this idea of a collective unitary mm -hmm. consciousness. 
I didn't know this liter literature existed. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, some of the, the great scientists, physicists, uh, including Erwin Schrodinger and David Bohm, uh, whom I got to know in his later years, stood up for this idea of the one mind. Schrodinger won a Nobel Prize in 1933. He's on record for saying that there is only one mind. Uh, th th this is a shocking statement for a Nobel Prize winning mm -hmm. physicist. It, I was certainly shocked by it. Mm -hmm. But I found out that it was not uh, just uh, uh, Schrodinger who had this idea. If you look uh, in the Western literature, you can find that Carl Jung uh, certainly believed this with his idea of the collective unconscious. William James, who founded American Psychology, was a strong proponent of a single collective unitary mind. And so was Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, America's great uh, transcendentalist philosopher. He called the one mind the oversoul. And you've gone way out on a limb writing and speaking about the power of prayer and one mind in the face of still a highly skeptical medical community. When you began so many years ago, did it frighten you, Larry? Yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> I was really uh, hesitant to uh, come forward at medical conference and speaking engagements uh, in a full-throated, enthusiastic uh, way about this idea because I knew that the tide uh, was firmly against uh, these these issues. Absolutely. Uh, I, I have to tell you, though, that, uh, and I'm happy to say this, it has never been easier than it is right now to talk about these issues because there's been a tremendous uh, transition in the medical schools toward the idea that consciousness can exist in a non-local way, which is to say outside the brain. Consciousness isn't made by the brain. It can do things that the brain is incapable of doing. It can act at a distance. It can acquire information from a distance. Brains can't do this. This is an idiot's way of saying that consciousness must be more than the brain. So uh, three decades ago, it was hard to get traction about these ideas. Since then, however, about three quarters of the medical schools in the United States have courses in their curricula for the impact of healing intentions, consciousness mediated healing, and they at least put on the table the double blind randomized control study showing that we're not making this stuff up, but it can be uh, uh, demonstrated in some of the best uh, known scientific traditions uh, th that exist today. Yes, yeah. Larry, if there were one last thing that you'd like our listeners to hear, what would it be? <laughs> Don't be so serious about the nature of consciousness and what, uh, and what uh, the future holds for you, even uh, after this life. I think the evidence is that uh, we are non-local. Uh, we are infinite. This, the uh, pictures that people bring back from nearly dying are extraordinarily marvelous. So uh, work hard, don't be too serious, enjoy nature, and, uh, uh, and spend time doing nothing. Let, let your understanding do you. Do not try so hard to do it. Allow your unconscious wisdom to bubble up and uh, you'll be happier, more creative, and healthier. That's wonderful. This has been truly fascinating. It's been an honor, Larry. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Well, the pleasure's been all mine. If you found value in this program, please do give it a thumbs up and press the subscribe button on your screen. It really does matter. And if you'd like to listen to my full hour-long interview with Dr. Larry Dossey, the web address is in the show notes below. In addition, just so you know, I'll be posting a new episode of this YouTube show each Tuesday at 6 a.m. Eastern Time. Also, please post any comments or questions you may have for me. I am interested and I'll respond promptly. 
For example, have you experienced the power of the mind in your own life? Has this led you to being happier, healthier, or more creative? For those of you who are deeply engaged in your own quest to becoming who you truly are, my path may not be the best path for you. I've talked about a way that I have moved forward toward increasing peace, but naturally only you can decide what path makes sense for you. For further information on the power of the mind, we recommend the following resources. A TEDx presentation by Peter Sage on the power of the unconscious mind. Also a TEDx talk by Sipor Maislik on the power of intention. And again, to learn about my own life journey and what it has taught me, we recommend my memoir, Nothing Bad Between Us, as well as our new historical novel called to be released November 2nd of 2021. The web addresses of each of these are in the show notes. And remember, we are together on this journey.